And welcome everyone to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Beyond Civil Rights, Dr. Martin Luther King's Activism in the 1960s. I'm joined by Peniel Joseph, Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Andy Mink. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Education Programs at the Center. On behalf of my staff, my team, Jira and Mike and Meredith, I want to uh, really express our appreciation for so many of you joining us tonight. Um, we're right in the middle of the, uh, the semester when I'm sure the days seem a lot longer than they, uh, they might have beforehand. Uh, the holidays are coming up, which adds its own uh, carbonation to your schedule and to the rhythm of what you're doing. But we appreciate you being able to come and, and have conversations around the ways that the humanities help us understand the world that we live in. In particular, I, as I look out on the audience tonight, I want to welcome Brian. Uh, Brian's joining us from Austin, Texas. Dean is here from Milwaukee tonight. Matt's here from Columbus uh, City Schools, and Roberta is joining us all the way from Jamaica. Hey, Roberta, thanks so much for joining. Um, Eric, I see that you're skipping your faculty meeting right now to be with us, uh, or perhaps you've got an earbud in and you're kind of doing a liminal thing. You're in both places. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. It's always nice to see you with us. As always, we have a lot of LAUSD teachers, Annette, Susanna, who's from Wilson High School, Catherine, who lives over in Long Beach. Uh, thank all of you for joining. Special thanks tonight, though, to Catherine. Catherine's a junior in high school. She's a student, and she's joining us. And uh, Catherine, I see that you dropped a question in the chat box. Please do in a moment uh, drop that same question in the Ask the Professor tab, and I'll make sure that we address it. National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina. I'm actually joining you from my home in Chapel Hill tonight. And uh, each year, we welcome a fellowship class of university-level humanists who if selected to work on a book project or research uh, uh, set of goals or do their writing, come to the center and they live, live with us for a full year. And uh, from that year, generate and imagine and create what really in some ways are the humanities. Um, as I lunch with uh, my colleagues, as I get to know them in the hallways and, and talk to them over the, uh, near the coffee machine, I'm always struck by how many of them are really interested in offering their voice and their experience and their expertise to educators. Um, this, is, you know, this, this is a very flat hierarchy. This is a conversation really between equally expert professionals, perhaps in slightly different ways, but maybe in a, in a whole Venn diagram of our work, uh, work that collides as well. As educators, you stand in front of students of all ages every single day, and you uh, figure out ways to make uh, topics and content and scholarship more accessible and uh, give your students a chance to differentiate and connect that and make it relevant. And scholars do the same thing, right? They, uh, they tackle these complex questions. They uh, find themselves uh, faced with other questions that they didn't realize were coming. They use all the evidence and the, and the work uh, to, to try to generate that kind of hypothesis that can then become our understanding of who we are. And I wanna thank all of you for being a part of that conversation. There are many resources uh, that we make available at the center that I think can contribute to that process for you. They're all free and open and located in the Humanities in Class Digital Library. That does include the resources that we've collected and curated in association with tonight's webinar. Um, each of you can also select and save these to your own private uh, profile. That does include the readings and the instructional materials that we've put together um, that associate with Dr. King and this, this particular topic. One of the real advantages of the Digital Library, though, is not just that we can offer all of the National Humanities Center work, uh, we can also invite many other organizations located all over the country representing many different disciplines to also share their work. And they've agreed to do so and again, a free and open way so that you know there's no cost and that the copyright license allows you to use it for educational purposes. I'm very pleased to uh, invite and welcome Jennifer Fisher tonight. Jen's uh, joining us from New Mexico and she's going to share with us just a little bit about one of those organizations. It's called Journeys in Film. Hey, Jen, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you all hear me? Sure can. Uh, tell us more about your resources and how it might relate to tonight's topic. Sure. So Journeys in Film provides free resources, just like the National Humanities Center does. All of our resources are free, and they are all, all core curriculum based. So they're going to be easy for you to connect to the core um, subjects and areas you're supposed to teach. We emphasize global understanding and understanding of difficult topics or topics that sometimes feel challenging in the classroom and really international learning the resources that we offer. Um, for most of our resources, we have full 
curriculum guides and lessons. For some, we also have discussion guides. So two that I wanted to highlight this evening are our resources for hidden figures, the very popular resource that we have. And for that, we have a full curriculum with several le lesson plans as well as a film discussion guide. So depending on what you're seeking and needing for your classroom, both are available. Um, another film I wanna highlight uh, is Just Mercy. Again, we have a curriculum guide with several civil rights focused lessons and a student learning guide. So some schools are still doing hybrid learning or independent student learning. And for Just Mercy, we put together a guide with that sort of independent learning in mind. Also, something that we will have in the new year is a film resource for CRIP Camp. And disability rights and disability justice is such an important topic that I think intersects heavily with civil rights in many ways. And certainly, CRIP Camp highlights the way the Black Panther Party supported their work in fighting for disability rights. So that's something that people might want to keep an eye out for or join our mailing list so that you're aware of that resource when it becomes available. Um, and here I've got our website, journeysinfilm.org, and there you can go to our library and see all of our free resources. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter so you'll know when we have new guides available, like the guide that's coming up for Crip Camp. And you can email me directly if you have any questions or concerns um, or you know need help with a resource or troubleshooting something of ours please do reach out to us. We, we love to hear from you and we're, we're always here to support. Sorry guys, listen, how long have I been doing this and I start talking with uh, with my mute button on? I, I apologize, Samantha, Marvin, Imelda, uh, Lee, all of you folks, I just caught on. Uh, and Jen, I wanna apologize to you because I just gave you tons of compliments for sharing what you did. And I'm gonna <laughs> encourage you to um, continue to chat in the audience chat box. So to repeat myself just briefly, um, if you do have interest in webinars around issues of uh, race and social justice, please do consider joining us for some of these upcoming sessions. We've got about 30 left between now and May. Um, and uh, I invite you to share this with your friends and your colleagues. And that includes joining the rescheduled session with Ayanna Thompson from Arizona State. Uh, she'll be joining us on November 30th, the Tuesday right after Thanksgiving to work on decolonizing the Shakespeare curriculum. As always, I wanna thank our Teacher Advisory Council for their continued uh, contributions and work uh, on behalf of the center. I see many of our previous and past uh, TAC members in the room tonight, Bonnie and Palo Alto, Wendy up in St. Paul. I wanna thank all of you for continuing to, to do that work and that does include Judy Freeman tonight, who is our TA. So tonight is a webinar that is focused on uh, voice and PowerPoint only, but it does include your voice. And I wanna encourage all of you to continue to chat and ask questions and drop links and ideas in the audience chat box. I also wanna encourage you to uh, contribute any kind of more formal question in the Ask the Professor tab. As the moderator, I'll queue those questions up and when the time is right, I'll bring those to uh, Professor Joseph and we'll go down that conversation as far as we can. If uh, at any point you lose audio or it seems like um, the technology is not working well for you, Believe me, I wish there were a more sophisticated answer. Really, all you need to do often is to close your window and come back in. That will not disrupt the session and it will not disrupt our record of you being with us. So oftentimes that's just a straight, um, a straight uh, self-assessment that you'll need to do. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tonight's session is titled Beyond Civil Rights, Dr. Martin Luther King's Activism in the 1960s. I'm joined by Peniel Joseph from uh, University of Texas at Austin and the History Department. Tonight's TA is Judy Freeman. Judy's a teacher at uh, the country's first public school, Boston Latin School in Brookline, Massachusetts. 
and she has contributed uh, instructional resources to the folder that will allow you to, uh, to connect this. Ooh, Professor, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. And um, so we're, we're going to, I'm going to speak for, I don't know, like, I want well, we're, our session to... goes, yeah, our session goes until about 830. So I would say, and typically what we do and what seems to work best is imagine this as a seminar or a conversation. Yeah. Um, at seven, uh, I'm going to have to do, at seven, my time, I'm going to have to do a little break because I've got my, my little daughter and I've got to have, um, Absolutely. I got to do, yeah, I, I just need a little break <laughs> before, right, no, right. No, after, no daughter, problem yeah. at all. And, and, and you know what, as we get going, if it, if it is that your family needs your attention, that's no problem. And we can, we can include a little bit early and, and uh, sort of finalize some questions. But before we get started, and you'll be able to advance the slides yourself at your own pace, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of credibility here. You know, we've got teachers from all over the country who have signed up and registered to use their precious private personal home time to join us. But you were sprinting across the campus in Austin to, to get here. All of them understand what that's like. You've got your your briefcases flying behind you. Your, uh, your coat is probably open. Um, you're a teacher, not just a scholar. What's it like at UT Austin when you talk about these kinds of topics? What, what are your students, many of whom could have been in the classes of the educators with us tonight, what do they bring that you either have to dispel or you have to leverage? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I'm teaching an uh, undergraduate seminar right now of 18 freshmen um, on, on my book, and it's on Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., so it's looking at both of them. And, you know, I think the thing that I try to leverage is their curiosity, and I do think that they are, you know, open-minded, um, even though some people are coming from conservative or progressive or moderate or even apathetic backgrounds yeah, um, sure. about all this. Um, I think the thing to dispel would be um, when it comes to, one, they don't know anything about Malcolm X, and then mm -hmm. two, Dr. King, they are not aware of Dr. King's radical activism, his revolutionary activism, the anti-war activism, uh, the criticism of, of institutional racism, systemic racism. They're really not aware of how much of a revolutionary figure Dr. King, in fact, was. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's really, it's going to be a focus for us tonight. And I, I suspect that many of our attendees uh, maybe have the same kind of gaps in, in this understanding. As an historian, how do you separate or do you separate the individual from the movement? What, what's it like to try to balance that tension between the icon and then the long movement that involves many anonymous people? Well, I think you're trying to look at how uh, the movement impacted the individual um, and sort of get them away from iconography and how uh, the individual impacted the movement, because I think you really need both. So I think that sometimes people will write um, social histories, and and I'm a big fan of social histories, um, and and sort of um, at the extreme end, sort of almost the suggestion that you know these social movements don't need a particular leader or person or or group of people. I I don't think that that's true. I think that you know the they actually did in that historical context. But but at the same time, I also don't think that individuals sort of just bend history to their own will. And right. that's where um, there's this, this dialectical process and relationship, this give and take between um, movements and individuals. And you try to talk about King, I try to talk about King as an individual uh, who's part of a larger collective and not really as just an icon as well. Right, right. Well, thank you again for leading us through this conversation. Uh, as the moderator, again, I'm going to be bringing comments and questions to you on occasion. Uh, you can simply use your cursor if you hover on the slide deck that's in the middle of your screen, and you can advance the slides at your own pace. Um, and we're looking forward to, uh, to, to walking through this with you. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, let's go to the first slide. Um, okay, so I, I think one of the 
things I want to start off with, with uh, uh, looking at Dr. King and beyond civil rights is just this idea. I think we are still, and I think there's a, a disjuncture or a dissonance between the general American public and, and the way in which um, academics in higher education in, in a larger way view King. So I do think within the context of the academy, um, the idea of King as a more radical figure, more revolutionary figure, is is much more mainstream than it is within popular culture. So I definitely would say that. But the reason why popular culture is so important and K through 12 education is so important is because in large part, that's the massive ball game of, of public opinion, what people are learning in school. Um, so the very fact that we have um, such a skewed vision of King in popular culture sort of hurts us all because we're not understanding um, what his actual vision and how challenging his vision um, is. I've got this quote here, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, we are caught in an, in, in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, this is really important because uh, Dr. King and this idea of uh, mutuality and the single garment of destiny um, is really a global human rights champion. And I think for a time, uh, mainstream uh, politics accepts this when it seems like it's only going to be focused on eradicating uh, racial segregation in the South. And I think as people start to see that in certain ways, um, the racial segregation in the South for King was was part of a much larger concentric circle uh, that he was interested in in deconstruction, deconstructing and, and sort of eradicating. Uh, King becomes uh, perceived as as some kind of genuine threat uh, to American democracy. Um, even as King is, you know, the foremost uh, nonviolent activist of, of of his generation, or really in some ways any generation. So, I think it's important for us to understand that there are certain quotes from King, including this one, which people might think of as anodyne, that become very, very threatening once he starts to talk about these issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, U.S empire and imperialism and the Vietnam War and poverty and capitalism and economic inequality, racism. Uh, so that's what's interesting of, about King. Um, this idea of the radical citizenship of, of uh, Mark, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you know, I take this idea from um, my, my book, uh, The Sword and the Shield, and I, I really conceptualize one of the things when you're trying to write something and you're, you've studied somebody for so long, and I'm actually going to be working on another <laughs> book on King as, as well, so this is, you know, I'm, I'm very, very interested in Dr. King, um, is you're trying to sort of uh, conceptualize their, their political thought and activism, like what, what is the central theme? And I think there's many ways to do this. So some people it would be a religious theme. Some people, it would be, you know, something else. For me, I think the, the core of what Dr. King is trying to do is um, transform what we mean by citizenship uh, in the United States, and I would argue also globally as well. And and uh, you know, I write in the Sword and the Shield that that Dr. King's most enduring legacy is the commitment to an introduction. Of radical black citizenship for Malcolm X, it was radical black dignity. Um, over time, they both come to converge and sort of champion uh, both of these concepts. But for King, when he talked about citizenship, it was more than just uh, voting rights and and ending uh, the kind of um, racial oppression that we saw in the post-war period of of Jim Crow racial segregation. Um, you know, King talked about a citizenship where jobs and income were guaranteed and protected, uh, decent housing for all, um, 
integrated public schools and neighborhoods, uh, you know, food justice, environmental equity. And he talked about an end uh, to violence, both sort of the terrorism that black people lived under in the South, but also state sanctioned violence, whether that was going to come from the police or the military, both within the context of US domestic policy, but also foreign policy. And, and this is really important because it, it, it's King's idea of this, this notion of radical citizenship that really is going to push him beyond civil rights, beyond the Voting Rights Act of 65, Civil Rights Act of 64, um, post Watts, uh, Dr. King. Even as I will concede, like some scholars will say, well, he was making um, very some radical speeches in the 1950s and talking about labor unionism and <clears throat> talking about some aspects of this, these issues. But but I I would push back and say what you really start to see him really dig down. Really, I would say I'd started at the March on Washington, um, even as people misconstrue that speech, including letter from Birmingham jail. So I'd say 63. And it really gets ratcheted up the last three years. I would say from 63 to 68, we're seeing it. But in 63 and 64 and parts of 65, it's blurred by the mainstream adulation in certain quarters that comes from the March on Washington, it comes from Time Magazine Man of the Year and 63, access to JFK and LBJ. And then, of course, the Nobel Prize. And he's the youngest Nobel winner in history up until that point before before um, Lala, he's the youngest. And so in certain ways we're not we're not we have to be on the lookout for the radical king. And sometimes there are radical things that King is saying in one historical context that people are either sort of ignoring or sort of identifying as being comfortably within the framework of um of of American exceptionalism. Um, when we think about the March on Washington, I think this is a case in point. Uh, King starts that speech by saying, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. And this is where, you know, I think I'm always interested in King, citizenship and democracy. I think King is one of the foremost uh, theorists of democracy in, in American history. And I think when we think about uh, King's theorizing of of um, American democracy, it's very, very important to understand that King becomes one of the, the you know, what I would argue is a third American founding. You know, um, Eric Foner talks about uh, Reconstruction as the second American founding, and I agree. And I think the civil rights movement represents a, civil rights and black power movements represent a second uh, Reconstruction period in America. And I think King is one of the the architects of that founding. And for King, this idea of democracy is much more expansive than the founders had originally conceived of, but very wisely because King is a social movement leader who's also um, a diplomat too. So I wouldn't call him a politician, but I'd say he's, he's, he's a diplomat. And what he does very wisely is he couches, and he does this in Letter from Birmingham Jail as well, but also at the March on Washington, in, in a way, in Letter from Birmingham Jail, in a in a very fulsome way, he places his reimagined conception of American democracy and citizenship, and he ties it into uh, the paradigm and the framework of the founders, um, and and he's really doing something very interesting here because he understands what he's doing. He's He's gaining legitimacy by, and he, he says this in Letter from Birmingham Jail, he says that the young people were being arrested in Birmingham in the spring of 1963, over 1,100, um, uh, some as young as the third grade are arrested, right, for protesting. And certainly Birmingham historically is where uh, the German shepherds and, and the, the hoses that are powerful enough to strip the bark off trees are directed against black protesters in uh, Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham. So it's really a national and global shame. You've got French newspapers who are calling white authorities 
in Birmingham in 1963, savages with above the fold uh, headlines that call white Americans um, sauvage, which means savages. So it's really extraordinary uh, what's happening in the United States in 63. And what he says there is that the young people who are being arrested and being oppressed and marginalized in Birmingham, Alabama, are one day, he calls them these, the America's disinherited children, will one day uh, be lionized by another generation and he says, for bringing us all back to those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the Founding Fathers. Now, this is a rhetorical sleight of hand. The Founding Fathers never imagined Martin Luther King Jr. or Hillary Clinton or Susan B. Anthony, none of it, okay? But what he's doing is saying, I get how important these are to the conception of the nation. And I'm tying what we're doing, which is way outside the parameters of the founders, way outside. They couldn't have imagined Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, none of this. Colin Powell, <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, the founders were not for any of that, <laughs> okay? It's important for us to understand. But he's tying that, that future to the founders. So it's re really, it, it's genius. It's genius. So, um, um, and, and that's why I think, you know, one of the many reasons why King is such a profound theorist of of democracy, just small d democracy. Um, this idea of we come here to cash a check, uh, Dr. King and reparations, that is part of the speech. There's a critique of white supremacy. He talks about um, the, the 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 lips of the governors of Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, their their lips are uh, uh, dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, and and. And that's Reconstruction era, white supremacist, redemptionist language, interposition and nullification about states' rights even after the Civil War, right? That's, that's all uh, this kind of um, excuse for uh, uh, black oppression and the marginalization of black people. Um, uh, he says in the I Have a Dream speech uh, that we're going to have to struggle together and march together. But he also says we're going to have to go to jail together. And that's a very important part of the speech because you only have to go to jail if you are protesting for civil and human rights uh, in an unjust society. Later on, he's going to start saying America is a sick society and that he's only the physician diagnosing the illness. He didn't cause the disease when he starts getting even more vociferous pushback. And obviously, the death threats were always uh, constant. So it's important for us to remember that, yes, even at the March on Washington, which is August 28, 1963, um, Wednesday, he, he's, uh, he's making radical critiques of, of American um, democracy. Um, you know, I would argue that the radical king comes into clearer view uh, by 1965. And it's interesting because he, 1965 is... The last time, you know, King, Dr. King's two speeches that are broadcast live uh, before, in, in, towards the entire nation is going to be the March on Washington speech and the, 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 the Selma speech, uh, the Montgomery speech after the Selma to Montgomery demonstrations actually concluded uh, May uh, 21st to May 25th. So that's May 25th, 1965. And these are high points. Uh, for King, high points for King and his relationship with LBJ. But there are cracks showing even then uh, because, one, we see the unmitigated uh, state-sanctioned violence on, on Bloody Sunday, uh, March 7th, 1965. King is not there. King is still in Atlanta. But this is where John Lewis and others are going to be uh, brutally um, bludgeoned by Alabama state uh, troopers, some on horseback, with uh, electrified cattle prod. So it's really uh, evoking the bullwhip days of racial um, slavery. And, and, you know, so much of these marches and demonstrations become basically a continuation of the Reconstruction era, which was violently halted uh, by, 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 by white supremacist um, uh, terror and, and violence, but also policies that got sewn into the very fabric of the country's um, ecosystem, our banking, our taxes, our insurance policies, our infrastructure, um, uh, you know, prisons, uh, business, um, schools, uh, churches, 
all of that comes out of uh, the terror of, of Reconstruction. So in a way, you know, King is trying to follow up on what people like Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass and others from that era tried to do. Um, the partnership with LBJ is important, and this is probably its last very, very productive year. You know, so I'd say that in 1964 and 65, they have a very... Mm, important partnership, really right from the point of the Kennedy assassination. So that's November 22nd, 1963. Um, the Watts Rebellion and the Great Society are going to be very key here because it's really Watts. King, um, he really cut short his vacation uh, to um, go down to Watts. And Watts is not, Watts is a middle class uh, neighborhood of 50,000 black people who, which explodes after uh, uh, police um, brutalize a suspected black car thief. And LAPD have been uh, brutalizing and, and, and murdering black people for decades and decades. And, and Watts, um, just like Harlem in 64, where a 15-year-old was shot and murdered by the New York Police Department, Watts uh, gives us an example of what Black Lives Matter activists were protesting in by protesting against by 2013, but in 1965. So this is just a replay in many different ways of, of, of this earlier uh, historical uh, period. And so Watts shows you what is wrong with the Great Society in the sense that the Great Society does not invest the kind of resources you need for the depth and breadth of the problem. So there are going to be some successes like Head Start in the Great Society. There's going to be successes, Mississippi Child Development Group. There's going to be some successes, um, but the Great Society doesn't do the investment um, um, that is required for the need. And that's, in a lot of ways, the falling out between Dr. King and LBJ, you know, it's not just Vietnam, it's the lack of investment in the Great Society that King ties to Vietnam. And then certainly King is going to have um, uh, his own um, interest in Vietnam as this massive human rights um, violation. Uh, this is just a quote from the book that talks about um, the lonely islands of poverty and how King is talking and focusing on economic justice um, and talking about uh, demanding a check uh, be cashed on behalf of Black America. Um, Malcolm and Martin, I talked about King's uh, citizenship. Malcolm is talking about radical Black dignity, which which he really argues is a, a world uh, without um, anti-Black racial violence, but that is really more personal. It's political, but it's personal in the sense of Malcolm is arguing that Black people have to see themselves as worthy, uh, their their lives as worthy of being defended. Um, um, so when we think about uh, saying Black Lives Matter, Malcolm both said that, but then also said that Black people had a deeper history uh, than just racial slavery in the United States, which is why he takes several, many, many, actually many trips to Africa on, on three separate occasions in 59 and twice in 64. And, you know, Malcolm, this idea of radical black dignity, Malcolm is much more skeptical of American democracy than King. So until 64, right around this time, this picture is taken in the ballot or the bullet speech, Malcolm is disinterested in processes and institutions um, connected to American democracy because Malcolm, what Malcolm uh, really how Malcolm portrays the situation really is like he, he's a prosecutor, and I write this in the book. He, he prosecutes America for a series of crimes against black humanity. And so as that prosecutor, he's not interested in um, ideas about democracy as being something that's fundamentally real and tangible. He's very, very skeptical about it. He is going to pivot and that's where he's going to become much more of this global statesman once he leaves uh, the, the nation of, of Islam. Uh, when we think about the revolutionary king, um, 
Riverside. This is April 4th, uh, 1967, Riverside Church in New York. Um, you see Rabbi Heschel uh, next to King, um, or, or really two away from, from King, so King's left. Uh, Riverside marked King's transition from a civil rights leader into a political revolutionary, one who refused to remain quiet in the face of domestic and international crises. So when we think about Riverside, Riverside is King's departure from the American political mainstream. Um, at Riverside, not only is King speaking out against the, the Vietnam War, but King is making an argument that material, materialism, uh, militarism, racism are these triple evils, he calls them, uh, that are going to ruin both America and uh, humanity. Um, we're going to see really the seeds of the poor people's campaign here, uh, the prophetic king. Um, when we think about this revolutionary king, he's not afraid to talk about American empire. He is not afraid to talk about um, racism and white supremacy. Uh, he says we need a revolution of values, and this revolution of values are, are, is going to change the United States from a, a, a society more interested in commodities than people um, into a society that becomes so people oriented uh, they that it that 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 the society loves each other and that love is going to be um, expressed publicly in policies um, that cherish people and show how precious uh, we we all are so it's it's really quite um, it's quite remarkable <laughs> what what King is doing. Um, here. Um, and when you think about that boldness, this is King at the National Cathedral um, uh, uh, preaching the, 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 the Passion Sunday sermon. It is an unhappy truth that racism is a way of life for the vast majority of white Americans, spoken and unspoken, um, acknowledged and denied, subtle and sometimes not so subtle. The disease of racism permeates and poisons the whole body politics. And I can see nothing more urgent than for America to work passionately and unrelentingly to get rid of the disease of racism. Now they would call King a critical race theorist, right? And say he's just fomenting, you know, because we've got the new, the new McCarthyism, and we we can't we can't um, we can't say this. And states like my state, Texas, are actually passing legislation where K through 12 um, teachers and others can't can't say it. So obviously. Um, we're on a big precipice and, and sliding toward um, disaster and, and the end of democracy as we know it. But King was saying this in 68. This is five days before his assassination. And it's really important because I think one of the reasons why we don't want to talk about this revolutionary King is because um, we don't want the public, including a majority of white, but other people of color too, to feel bad when he's saying this. You know, he's saying racism is is an integral part of life. And uh, uh, here, let me let me shut this down. I'll I'll put it. I'll keep it right there. This 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 idea of of racism being intrinsic doesn't mean that King didn't think we could um, build that beloved community. But he was being honest. He was being honest. And I think in that sense, um, King. Uh, I'm giving some feedback. I think King. Um, Honesty becomes something that's hard for uh, audiences um, in our contemporary uh, context to sort of deal with. So in a lot of ways, it's just a face and a race, and we sort of keep King frozen um, in 1963 at the March on Washington. And I'll, I'll stop right there so we can have some uh, questions. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions that have, have come up, Professor, as you could imagine, and I, I'd like to bring these to you one at a time. Um, let me start with this question. This is from uh, Jacob. Jacob is joining us from Half Moon Bay, California, and he's wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the power of Dr. King as an orator, and specifically, and I'm going to add a little bit to this question, specifically when you work with your own students on his speeches and uh, and, and the work that he's done, do you personally, do you tend to give them the text version or do you like for them to hear his voice? 
And what's the power of that voice? You know, I've done both and I've had us like, you know, this semester we've read together letter from Birmingham jail. We've listened to some snippets um, as well, especially from during the Chicago campaign of 66, uh, the eyes on the prize episode, um, two nations, two Americas. Um, you know, I think obviously, yes, King is a very, very powerful um, order. And um, I think having our students listen to a speech uh, is important. Uh, but I also think that w what he's saying is equally important, you know? So I think that um, I, I, on some levels, I think that I'm one of those folks who, I think the power of oration is hugely important, uh, but I also think the words that the orator says is, mm -hmm. is equally important. And so I, I think that King has, has, um, has both uh, in that, in that regard, because the students definitely had goosebumps. Just we all took turns reading, and we finished it together, just out loud. Um, letter from Birmingham Jail, and that we we didn't have to hear him to sort of feel the power. But certainly, having knowledge of having listened to him um, w was important for the students. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this question comes from John. John is in uh, New York City, actually. Um, he's wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, Dr. King's work in the fight against poverty. Um, specifically, were there were there certain uh, was there a certain evolution, or were there certain um, moments or elements of of that of that work that he was doing that would be really important to highlight anytime you're talking about his his radical um, his radical activism. Yeah, I, I would say that, yes, I think, you know, when we think about Dr. King's public um, chronology, it's sort of December 1955 with Rosa Parks um, really leading the Montgomery bus boycott and King becoming um, an anodyne enough figure in Montgomery that he's picked because he's the least disliked figure among um, the organizers and activists, uh, but he's really not qualified to be what what you know some kind of political mobilizer he becomes a spokesperson who becomes a mobilizer um i would say that you know poverty and economic inequality is something that he's deeply aware of we know this from his writings as just a teenager but i do think and some scholars um, differ from me and and you know i disagree with them and that's that's the <laughs> that's how it works in terms of scholarship is that just because something is sort of percolating and you might mention it in speeches, even talk about it with your wife personally or your friend, um, doesn't have the same impact as when this thing, in this case, you know, poverty, becomes your main focus. So I think that as we see post-1965 with the Chicago campaign to try to not just desegregate housing in Chicago, that's a part of it. He's looking for economic uh, redistribution, redistributive justice uh, and redistributive economics in the city of Chicago. And he bumps up against uh, even black people who are part of uh, the, the daily mayor, daily plantation, the, 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 the political machine of the Democratic Party and the dailies in Chicago, 1966. And so what you start to see is that he goes and he's organizing with Marion Wright Edelman. Um, and he's, you know, really at the suggestion of, uh, of Marion Wright Edelman through Bobby Kennedy, who Bobby Kennedy said, Hey, bring the poor folks to Washington. And Bobby Kennedy had his own reasons because Kennedy, you know, wanted to be president. He wanted to be president, you know, and it's, it's, you know, who's to say what would have happened if he had, but the only way to get rid of the poverty would have required very, very radical congressional action that it's unlikely would have occurred no matter who was president. So when we think about the, the, the anti-poverty, that poor people's campaign is important because King is looking for, um, you know, the, 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 the poor people's campaign is an Occupy movement before Occupy Wall Street. It's Occupy the nation's capital. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign dovetails into aspects of Malcolm X's criticism of the March on Washington as something that was stage managed and orchestrated. Uh, they do not receive permission to go. 
King is assassinated before um, uh, Resurrection City is is uh, is complete. But he he gets together with um, uh, you know Hispanics and blacks and um, um, you know poor whites from Appalachia, just a rainbow coalition, indigenous folks. You know, Latinx, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole rainbow coalition gets together, and he's he's making this argument that you know poverty and ending poverty is central to um, ending ending racism and ending injustice and ending violence. So certainly he doesn't hone in on eradicating poverty in the laser-like way he does until until the 1960, late 60s and until after the passage of the major civil rights legislation of 64 and 65. Hmm. Let's go a little bit Let's deeper bit into deeper. his work in Chicago. Um, this question comes from Judy. Judy's joining us from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And you mentioned Chicago, but she's curious if you could talk a little bit more about how his work with workers in Chicago was received in that city, how it was covered by the Midwest media, and was Dr. King at all concerned about shaping his image or his message differently in that city? Well, I think Chicago is a test case. And I think that um, what happens to King in Chicago is that he really runs into a buzzsaw of not just the daily folks, but also uh, the very fact that um, when we think about Chicago, I mean, he's going to get bad press. Chicago, by the time he gets to Chicago, Black Power, uh, during his time in Chicago, comes out uh, while he's in um, uh, Mississippi alongside of Stokely Carmichael. You know, he's away that night, but then the next day he comes. So Black Power becomes this national force, uh, and that phrase is introduced June 16, 1966. So that's going to be very tough and difficult for him. Um, now that he's talking about poverty in this deep way, he's going to be seen as a rabble riser. He's talking about um, desegregating uh, housing, but he's talking about redistributive justice alongside of um, this this political machine. So, no, it's going to be very it's going to be very very um, in certain ways negative when he he in quotes takes the movement north, um, um, even as there was always a northern civil rights movement, but certainly King being in Chicago gives it a lot of attention. So, and I think, you know, King was a surprise somewhat because they had never, Birmingham had been the biggest city um, that the SCLC had tried to mobilize because King's organization was an organization of mobilizers. So they weren't necessarily grassroots organizers. What they did was go into cities where people were organized already and they knew that they could bring the intention and at times the fundraising to mobilize uh, a movement, um, have it have connections to the, the federal government because of King's relationship with the federal government, Department of Justice, presidents, um, and, and have impact that way and the press. Um, mm -hmm. So in Chicago, it, it doesn't it does it does not work in the same way uh, because things are changing. And King is 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 looking for something more. He's looking for something more than just sort of desegregation and promises. He's looking for redistributive uh, justice in Chicago. And and once yeah. that doesn't work, he's going to move towards the the national and the global stage and connect that redistributive justice to Vietnam to the extent that, like I said before, for King, he definitely feels Vietnam is an immoral war, but King does not have a problem with the great society. He's got a problem with the lack of investment in the great society, and he ties that lack of investment to the concern and the focus from, including the press. It's not just Lyndon Johnson and the Congress, but he's just saying, look, the nation is focused on this war, which is an unjust war, instead of being laser-like focused on eradicating all the reasons for our civil disturbances. So in a lot of ways, you can see why King is so upset. And from the perspective of history, He's absolutely right. And one of the oddest things of the 64 to 68 period is that you have the escalation of the Vietnam War and the internal disintegration of the country and many people realizing that and, and basically our inability 
um, to get out of that has produced the time we're in now. Because after King's assassination, the, the, the bait and switch is that there's a fair housing law passed, but the biggest, most consequential bill of the year is the uh, crime bill of 1968 that sets up uh, mass incarceration over the next 50 years. So we have a choice between law and order and the beloved community in 68, and we definitely choose um, law and order as defined as, you know, black, uh, the criminalization of whole black population uh, that persists until this day. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Bringing uh, that up. Uh, the next question the next is question coming from Dennis. Dennis. Dennis is joining, Dennis us, is joining from, us from, I think I have a little bit of an echo there. there. There you go. Thanks. Uh, Dennis is joining us from Northern Florida. He's wondering if you can talk some about ways that Dr. King did or did not utilize the principles of the founding fathers to combat racism. Well, you know, I think he does, but he expands it, you know, so if you're going to believe, um, you know, uh, we hold these truths to be self evident that all, all in the language of the fathers, all men are created equal. We would switch that up to, I would I would think humans are created equal and not with the gender distinction. Um no, he 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 uses that. He uses the language of 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 Jefferson and the language of of uh, uh the founding fathers about liberty and freedom and democracy. Um absolutely he uses that language. And I think in certain ways he believes it, but I think King is smart enough to know he's also um he's also expanding it in ways that they would not have imagined, could not have imagined, nor would have, uh, would they have approved of, right? So in, in a lot of ways, King is a great example of somebody thinking of the founding documents as something that's living and breathing and always expanding because certain generations have blind spots that new generations don't, right? Mm -hmm. You know, right. and King had his own blind spots. We think of one of the interesting parts as a historian of looking at the movement for black lives and their focus on, on um, intersectionality and their focus on, uh, you know, so many black women and black feminism and trans. And, and, and these are folks who within King's movement and Malcolm's movement were absolutely marginalized. Absolutely. And so new generations come up and they look at the blind spots that previous generations have and they say, Hey, these are great ideas. And, this should be expanded to include this group of people who it has not included. So that's what's so interesting. King is absolutely taking the founders, aspects of the founders, and, and, and expanding that vision where um, people who are sharecroppers and people who are Native American uh, reservations and, and people who are really poor white folks in Appalachia, too, um, who are part of the poor people's caravan, can share part part of that bound that bounty of of citizenship that that um, they've been excluded from. Great, thank you. I'm gonna. This next question is gonna take us in a little bit of a of a different direction. Coming from Catherine. Catherine is a junior in high school at Walton High School in Marietta, Georgia, and she's wondering if you can speak some about the way that the civil rights movement and the the, the period we're discussing changed other movements or impacted other movements in other countries? What was the global impact? Yeah, I think King's impact is global and the movement's impact. Both King and Malcolm X travel extend, extensively uh, around the country. Um, King winning the Nobel Peace Prize shows you um, the global context of what's happening. Uh, the African decolonization movements, decolonization in Latin America, Africa, um, um, resistance against uh, Soviet totalitarianism um, that's happening globally, um, the Vietnam War and resistance against American imperialism as well. So I think what you see with King, and I would I would add here, Malcolm is that they're both anti-colonial activists and theorists. It's just that they do their anti-colonialism in kind of different ways. King, it's a kind of until the war, the, the anti-war, anti-Vietnam stuff, it's a kind of mainstream anti-colonialism in the sense of he's, he's a Gandhian, he visits India, he visits 
Ghana. Um, he gets his Nobel Prize. Whereas Malcolm is sort of trying to visit Africa and the Middle East and be around folks who are revolutionary leaders, and sometimes who are part of guerrilla wars, and 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 he's interested on that side. So it's it's kind of like one is a a, a, a kind of sparkling, uh, clean kind of uh, anti-colonialism until a time that it's not, and the other is a, sort of just a very sort of defiant anti-colonialism. So I would say that uh, the civil rights movement has a huge global um, impact, including, of course, around Europe in terms of movements for self-determination. Uh, so in a, in a lot of ways, it's sort of is continuing um, something that had really been, um, when you think about the early 20th century and even Wilson's uh, short-lived League of Nations, this idea of self-determination, which didn't happen, um, and then the United Nations. King is, is somebody who, and again, I think Malcolm X as well, is making sure that happens. I'm going to um, have to take a break for parental duty, and I, I will be back, though. Thank you, Professor. And, you know, uh, of course, Professor, can you hear me? If so, yeah. go ahead and mute yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and mute that so, uh, so I don't okay. have to. Professor Joseph will be returning in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, I want to encourage all of you to continue to submit questions. Um, I appreciate your patience with uh, with the technology tonight, but also I think the empathy that as educators uh, I have, I think most, most, if not all of you have in terms of uh, balancing uh, family, uh, having young children at home as uh, Professor Joseph is running off to, to feed his daughter. All of you are doing this, right? You're, you're working all day and you're coming home to families. Uh, so we're going to be patient just for a few moments while he does that. Families certainly come first. And as we, um, as we are waiting, I want to remind you that if you join the Humanities in Class webinar series group, you'll have access to all the resources and the readings that are provided by our scholars, both in advance of um, our sessions, but also readings that you can reflect on and perhaps share with your students after the session. Uh, Jira, uh, my colleague Jira, does go into all of the recordings, and we put the full recording in the folder we also segment it. So if you go into some of the folders from previous webinars, you'll see that there are not only the full 90 minute webinar recording, but also shorter 10 and 12 minute recordings that are named by topics. That way you can pull them out, you can share them with your students, you can add them as an assessment perhaps, or maybe flip your classroom and have students view those before they come into class. I should also say, and again, Catherine, I appreciate you joining us and feeling so uh, so much a part of the group. Um, if any of you would like to assign webinars to your students, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, let me know in advance. I can always create and collect questions uh, to take to the speaker, or you can just uh, give them the login and the registration and invite them to attend either for, uh, for credit or again, in some kind of flipped classroom sort of model. Um, so there are lots of different ways you can use the webinar series and the resources that are attached to it. Finally, I should also remind you that I do put the PowerPoints from each session in that same resource at the conclusion of the webinar. So uh, if you go back the next day, or usually I try to do it the night of, uh, you can get the actual PowerPoint, you can download that, and you can modify it or remix it um, uh, to, to the students in the curriculum that you teach. Um, while we're waiting for Professor uh, Joseph, I also want to remind you that you know, many of you, I think, uh, attend, and we have a very loyal audience. A lot of you are with us all the time. Dexter, it's always great to see you with us. Um, and some of you might be doing that for the professional development credit, and I'm glad that this seems like value added for you to get your credit through these sessions. Some of you, though, may find yourself uh, come up a little bit short or maybe need some credit uh, later in the spring. I know last year in, uh, I should say this spring, 2021, just a few months ago, uh, many of you reached out at the conclusion of the webinar series when you realized that you'd come up just a little bit short in your annual expectations, maybe in your teaching portfolio or uh, for the credit that you need to earn. If that's the case, I would encourage you to take a look at our online course catalog. We've got about 10 titles now. These uh, range across the humanities. They're all developed for adult professionals, and so you'll be in a class and a course with other educators from around the country, and each of these uh, courses earns 
35 professional development credit hours. So uh, it's like taking uh, attending five webinars. And in fact, each module of each course is set up to be about five hours of work per week, which is about what we ask you to do in the webinar itself. So it's a great way to uh, invest in your own professional growth. Uh, it's a great way to get more, uh, be more immersive in some of the topics like this one from the 60s to now using music to explore issues of race, gender, and sexuality in contemporary American history. Um, and it allows you to, uh, to interact with others and develop your own instructional materials with that kind of facilitation and scholarly input. So take a look at our website. Um, I think there's also a link on a tab that's on, on your screen right now, and you can uh, check that out. So uh, while we're waiting for Professor uh, Joseph, I wonder, uh, again, feel free to drop some questions in the audience chat and or the Ask the Professor tab. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a plug for the professor. If you need something to read that is groundbreaking, compelling work, please do uh, check out uh, Peniel's book, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this is really a fantastic read. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of scholarship. And it really does uh, give you a chance to, and again, in an immersive uh, sort of comparative way, uh, explore the, the, the life and the impact, lives and the impact of both of these uh, iconic figures. So that's a little bit of a summary for you. Uh, what else is happening? Um, one other thing I'll mention to you is that uh, yesterday we opened the application process for a two-week summer institute that we will be hosting in person at the center. Uh, this institute is titled Contested Territory, America's Involvement in Southeast Asia, 1945 to 1975. Uh, for 10 days, we're going to be welcoming up to 36 educators from all over the country. Uh, we have a stipend for uh, all who are selected of $2,200. You come to North Carolina for two weeks. Uh, you stay in a nice hotel, come to the center every single day and work uh, side by side with lead scholars on America's uh, role in Southeast Asia during the mid 20th century. We're gonna be taking a slightly different approach though, in addition to historians and looking at the history of our uh, relationship with Southeast Asia, we're also gonna be looking through the lenses of other humanities disciplines, art, language, literature, um, uh, geography, economics, and really try to understand the complexity of that relationship. It's more than just the Vietnam War. Of course, that's what all of you uh, know and teach. It's the biggest part of your curriculum. But if you go back just 15 years to the uh, early 1950s and really begin to understand the French relationship with Vietnam, the colonial, uh, long colonial history of um, America's role in Southeast Asia, that then takes us into the early 1970s. The application process is opened and I would encourage uh, all of you to consider applying. These are This is only for K-12 teachers, and the applications will be accepted until March the 1st. So uh, I just did uh, a really great summary, but what I was really doing in that commercial break is making sure that Professor Joseph's daughter is fed. Peniel, is that the case? Did you get her a plate of food? Well, gee, this, it was really bedtime at this point. Oh, bedtime. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, as, you know, my kids are a little bit older than that, but bedtime and food are all, it's all, you got to take care of your family first. That's absolutely yeah. the most important. Well, I thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we were reviewing not only uh, other activities at the center, but the ways, uh, much of what you've shared. And I'm just going to jump right into another question, if it's all right with you, and we'll go for about another 15 minutes or so. Oh, sure. Um, this question comes from Jonathan. Jonathan lives just north of Asheville, North Carolina, in a little town called Weaverville. And Jonathan's wondering if, if you can make this distinction. Was Dr. King anti-capitalism, or did he believe in capitalism with a conscience? Yeah, you know, that's a great... Um... You know, and I think you can be both. I think he's a, he's a, I could say that he's a critic of capitalism, right? He's a critic of capitalism. Um, so I think that um, how would, I can't say exactly how would King have felt about sort of a U.S. capitalism that went even beyond um, the New Deal in terms of that was focused on racial equity and provided sort of health care and, and a floor for everyone, um, yet still was a capitalist society. 
I could see him still having criticism, but um, you know, he he was interested, I think, in in a kind of capitalism that could flourish alongside of um, democracy, you know, and he talked about very very approvingly social democracies. Obviously, social democracies in places like Scandinavia, where he visited approvingly when he won the Nobel, um, had a very different history than the United States. So the, the idea that that could work here, um, I'm not saying it can't, but I also think it's unproven. It's unproven. And so um, I would say that he definitely was a critic of capitalism, um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that because of that, he was, um, I understand what you mean by anti-capitalism that sort of just was going to try to get, wanted to get rid of that system um, mm. completely. Yeah. This question comes from Tisha. Tisha is joining us from Connecticut. And uh, first of all, she wants to thank you for your insights. Um, one of her colleagues pointed out recently that today when we discuss the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with our students, they often don't realize that he was a religious leader. They see him as an activist alone. Uh, maybe this is because our society is more secular, but can you talk a little bit about the ways in which uh, Dr. King's faith and spiritual identity involved, if any, as the revolutionary King emerged? Oh, yeah. I think that Dr. King definitely, you know, he's not only a Christian, he's, in, he's a proponent of the social gospel. And so when you think about social gospel, Christianity, it's just, you know, especially the black social gospel has been pretty radical in making the claim that um, uh, sort of Christianity uh, is a powerful tool for uh, eradicating oppressions um, that are that are on earth and you don't have to wait to get to heaven. So part, part of the whole idea of the social gospel was utilizing the teachings um, um, both of Old and New Testament as as anti-poverty to to gain more truth and to ease suffering. Um, so that's much different from sometimes certain kinds of Christianity that um, are are very comfortable with economic um, inequality and very comfortable with uh, racial segregation. And and King um, King combated that himself. So I would say that his faith got got deeper in that sense. And I think that's when you start, you know, um, uh, uh, start getting in terms of the revolution of values and uh, deeper insights into his vision of, um, you know, beloved community. The great book on this, if you want to, um, for your students would be um, Strength to Love. You know, those are really his biblical writings and scriptural writings. And so I think I think he's a Christian. Uh, he's a Black Baptist Christian. But he's also a social gospel theologian. Um, King is a, a very much inspired in certain ways by Gandhi. So nonviolence is a philosophical and spiritual calling for him as well as something that's strategic and political. Um, I do believe he felt he had a calling and and that calling, um, you know, sutured and 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 uh, really bound him um, when he was facing. Uh, you know, he talked about uh, mountaintop moments versus uh, mountaintop moments versus valley moments. And uh, by the end, he's really largely uh, in 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 the valley uh, by the end. And um, his faith is a big big part of of why he. Um, I think he, he definitely receives um, the unmerited grace that, um, you know, we all deserve, but rarely receive uh, through his faith, right? Not, not in, in, in the world um, by the end, but through his faith. So I do think we have to think of him as a religious leader. And we could teach him as a religious leader with all the flaws in terms of his own personal life. You know, your, your own personal contradictions um, should not detract from your 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 faith. Um, uh, people should be able to talk about that and weave that in uh, because human beings are complicated. Part of being a human being is being able to sort of live with contradictions, your personal contradictions 
and the contradictions in the world, even if you want both your personal and outward self to be more aligned, just like you want the world's ideal of itself and its reality to be more aligned. So I think King is, is like most of us in that way, where he's pursuing alignment uh, because he understands uh, the paradox of that. Yeah. Great. Uh, this question comes from Rashid. Uh, Rashid is in Morocco, and Rashid would like to know if you agree with James Baldwin when he says that the assassination of Dr. King marked the end of the civil rights movement. No, I don't agree with that, but I do think, I understand why Baldwin, who knew King and knew Malcolm, felt that way. But no, I think that's where um, a lot of times history has it wrong, or historians, or popular history. These one leaders like King or Kennedy being assassinated do not end movement. What they, what they can signal, though, is that a kind of high point uh, of sort of being able to captivate large numbers of people and make them pay attention um, is now diminishing. You know, it's now diminishing. So I would say that even for those of us who are in this historical time period from, say, Barack Obama all the way to 2020 and, and the, the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matter and the pandemic. And I've called this the third reconstruction and I have a, I have a book coming out next year on this. Um, but I think that we're going to understand these periods as not sort of ending sort of civil rights and ending social justice, racial justice struggles. But, you know, you look at Obama and, and, and the period of 08, 09, and then obviously his presidency, and you're going to say, especially the 08 period, 09, early 09 period, it, it is a high point. It, it is a high point. It's, it's a period that um, uh, some people would love to recapture again. It's an extremely hopeful period for a little more than half the nation. When you look at the voting numbers over there, you know, he gets around, you know, 51%, 52%. Um, which is which is pretty high in a very divided nation, um, but it doesn't mean because you you get um, the results of the 2016 election that the phone the the ferment that produced Obama somehow ends. It, it certainly means that in that historical context it has waned, and then you saw what happened in 2020 in a way where it, it, it shot back up again. So history, these big figures and their assassinations don't necessarily end the movements. Movements are bigger than one person, but they can signal to you and signal to the world a diminishment or ascent. You know, and I think that's why in some ways people wanted to take uh, the 2008 um, election and sort of the passion that came with the election of Obama as sort of this signal uh, that the, the period that we're talking about had concluded, had come to an end. And even people, you know, we talk about critical race theory now, but people use this term post-racialism, which I think was much more salacious than, than, than CRT. Um, but, but that was, you know, people were mistaken. People wanted to use this. And I certainly think 08 is very special, even in the context of the mortgage crisis and everything, to find that a black person, let alone this this man who's you know biracial, African and and, and and white American, could be the symbol of global hope and not just American renew, renewal, democratic renewal globally, is quite extraordinary given the history that we are uh, looking back from. You know, so it's it's quite extraordinary, and I, I don't think because of 2016 you can say well okay, that period is over because of this person's election. But you can definitely say there's a, there's a diminution of those energies given what's at stake. So King's, King's assassination is absolutely going to um, close off some doors, but that civil rights movement continues. I mean, it's post-King that you're going to get Barbara Jordan and, and, and expansion of voting rights in 75 and keynote at Democratic National Convention. It's post-King that you're going to get uh, much more access uh, for for black and Hispanic and other uh, union workers and laborers. It's post King that you're going to get racial integration 
uh, in, in certain aspects and the creation of more black wealth uh, among the middle class and upper middle class and elite. So there are these opportunities and doors that open, but then there's other doors that close, especially around the carceral state and punishment and, and, and the politics of prisons and policing, absolutely. So um, uh, I think Baldwin is being hyperbolic, but he personally felt it that way. So I understand why he wrote that. Uh, this question, yeah, comes, this question from comes from Marvin. Uh, Marvin's in Los Angeles, and he asks um, if you agree, and is it correct to infer that Dr. King was assassinated because he was becoming too radical? Yeah, no, I think I think I think Dr. King is assassinated because he's he's a political revolutionary in 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 times that are very anti and counter revolutionary, and and. Um, you know, in certain ways, the counter-revolutionaries end up um, with their own victories uh, through through they were set up for 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 victory in ways that that folks like King were not set up for. So I would say that um, yes, he's considered this revolutionary figure, and um, you know, however we look at that assassination, it, it silences. Um, a strong voice that was growing more powerful um, among the margins and among people at the lower frequencies. So it was a strong, strong voice. And we don't know how, what would have occurred if, if, if that voice is allowed to sort of coexist alongside the tides of the, of, of the 1970s in the next decade. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, this question is, is intended to invite you to take it in whatever direction you'd like. <laughs> um, we've had a couple of questions around this already pop up. You've mentioned it now several times. And of course, we have to start with the, the agreement that capital C, capital R, capital T, critical race theory is not being taught in a K-12 classroom no. as, a, as, a, as a legal yeah. framework is not being taught. However, <laughs> using, it, using it just as kind of a, a marker term, um, our last webinar featured uh, Jody Amore. He's a professor of law at University of Southern California. And uh, we asked the same question, you know, what, what is your perspective as, uh, as a historian, as a scholar, legal scholar? Um, he was specifically talking about uh, the systemic racism um, that sparked from the 92 LA riots. And the question I'm gonna pose to you is the same one we asked him, which was, from your perspective, what would be kind of that concise, short, um, clear response for all the educators in the room tonight who will be teaching in a reasonable and, uh, and informed way? What's the response when they're accused of teaching critical race theory? When we explore yeah. topics like this, what, what would you say about this, this context that we're now living in? You're in Texas. I mean, yeah. this is a big deal for teachers. Yeah, no, I would tell teachers to tell folks that, you know, you know, what people are calling critical race theory um, and this whole weaponization of that term is, is an expansion updating of the lost cause. And the lost cause uh, goes back to Reconstruction, and it is a, uh, a racist mythology and falsehood that is hugely powerful politically and policy-wise that uh, the Civil War was not fought off of slavery, uh, Reconstruction was a bad thing, uh, the white supremacists of the South were heroes who were just defending white womanhood from the rape of uh, predatory black men. So the lost cause um, is what John Kennedy learns at Harvard through the Archibald Dunning School of History. The lost cause is birth of a nation and gone with the wind. Uh, mint juleps and slavery was awesome. Right. And so critical race theory, anti CRT is saying we want to keep that up forever. Right. Because 1619 Project, New Origin Story, Black Lives Matter, questioning all these things and saying that, look, we've got to talk about racism as a constituent element of, 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 of this democracy, of this country. And so I would tell them that, look, that's what CRT is. And they try to initially. Um, uh, Tom Cotton and, and, and different 
uh, uh, politicians tried to pass legislation to ban 1619, uh, and that became more capacious, and, and they came up with CRT through a blogger. Um, and, you know, these are the very same folks who are saying that they don't want to be canceled, and they don't want uh, to be woke, and they want freedom of speech, and they're passing legislation, both that is the voter suppression legislation since 2013, uh, and this Supreme Court case, Shelby v. Holder, and uh, anti-CRT legislation. So CRT is just um, a, a stand-in. It's a MacGuffin. It's a Trojan horse. Um, and again, one of the things that the right wing has been very effective at doing is um, lying and, and consistently using a lie until that lie takes on a life of its own, including lies that the January 6th uh, white supremacist riot at the U.S. Capitol was not what we all saw it was. That's, that's one of the biggest lies. And it's, it, you know, it's Fox News. It's, it's so many different um, media uh, scapes that are saying this. And so I would say what teachers should be saying is that, look, we realize what this is. We want to teach, um, we want to teach American history. Uh, both the good, uh, the bad, and the ugly of that history, because that's the only way we can tell the truth about that history and, and, and raise a new generation of critical the uh, thinkers. Um, uh, we are not teaching uh, what they're claiming as CRT, but we're also aware of what their notion of CRT is actually linked to. So this is actually linked to the Confederate monuments. It's linked to the Confederate flags. It's linked to a whole very, very distorted way of seeing American history. And because an earlier group of redemptionists versus reconstructionists, redemptionists are the white supremacists, the reconstructionists are the anti-racists, because the earlier group of redemptionists won through violence, through policy, through Jim Crow laws, and sort of turned America into a southern nation, we have the lost cause 1.0 in the 19th century, 2.0 uh, with the reconstruction of the Klan in 1915, uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, and by 1925, 26, 40,000 Klansmen are marching in Washington, D.C., right? Klan 3.0 in the 1950s and 60s with massive white resistance, and that Klan 3.0 included uh, the good white folks who were part of the White Citizens Council, <laughs> who were preachers and pastors who loved Billy Graham. Um, and 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 went to the PTA, and these are the same white folks who are shouting and screaming at the Little Rock Nine in September of 1957, and 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 multiple uh, uh, photos of of school desegregation, screaming at little black girls that you can find from the 50s and 60s and 70s. And so, really, 4.0 has been um, um, with with Trump, and you can argue this is 5.0 because Kathleen Ballou has the great book, Bringing the War Home, and looks at post-Vietnam and how you had the ratcheting up of white supremacy and, and terrorist groups after every war, and and how uh, Larry Beam and all these folks in the 1980s become part of a resurgent Klan, and then so what Trump has done is is tap into that. There's there, there are anti-status Klan groups by 1983 declaring, during the Reagan administration, declaring war against the United States. And that's where you get, uh, they, they have the, the Turner Diaries and their, their, their fantasy novels about uh, extreme right-wing folks taking over the United States uh, through, through warfare. So I'd say that when you think about CRT, that's where you have to go. And I know that's been long-winded, but it, it really is. You've got to connect it to the lost cause and understand that this is what's happened in the 21st century. And I think people would be very surprised at this, and this is where I think King is very good for us, is that the King at the end of his life, who we was talking about today, really understood dramatically the breadth and depth of the problem that we face. And I think a lot of people in 2020 and with the Capitol riot, their eyes were open. And the Capitol rioters are white supremacists, they're supremacists, they're anti-Semites. Uh, they're coming for everyone. 
they're coming for everyone and not not just black people uh, and that's why the adl is on this and, and i've got good uh jewish uh friends and colleagues who are on this who are who are standing we're standing lockstep in solidarity with one another because we know what's coming and so uh, king realized that in a way that i think post obama many people did not they thought that that kind of hatred systematically had ended and what you're seeing with the anti-CRT is really um, a, a panoramic constellation of white supremacists. So it's not just uh, what we call white nationalists. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, the, 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 the Proud Boys and these, these others that were spoken of during the, Democrat, during the Republican National Convention and during presidential debates. It's a constellation of, of, of sort of working class, lower class, corporate, um, religious, uh, political, uh, higher education, and and K through 12, all there, uh, spinning this big lie of anti CRT. So uh, we're all in trouble, you know. And I think the, the 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 beauty of King is that he realized that, and then was calling us uh, forward with this whole idea of a beloved community and revolution of values. And there's no way to get out of that trouble until you confront it. So part of the problem for all of us as Americans in 2008 with Obama, people thought you could elect your way out of that trouble, right? You elect this, this man who's saying beautiful things, who believes in American democracy, wonderful things, but we can't elect our way out of this. You, you, you can't, you got to confront this and set up firewalls so that future generations are protected from this and won't have to be in the same, um, the same jam that we find ourselves in in November of 2021, because all of you are all educators on the line here. So um, we should all be very, very afraid. We should all be very, very afraid. Doesn't mean that we can't be bold and courageous, but those of us who care about uh, the country and care about humanity, care about our children, but also care about other people's children, uh, this is an extraordinarily frightening time uh, to be uh, alive in, in America right now. We used to all think and read the history books and say to yourself, man, what would I have done during Reconstruction? What would I have done during this time? Well, we're all living it. This is it. <laughs> this is it. So you get to star in the history. You know, we see the documentaries and we all say, what would we have done with Lincoln and all these people for the 60s and Black Panthers? You're in it. You're in it. The nightmare that they faced, you're in it. So that's what I would say. And I, now I know we're at time. So yeah, thank you so much, Andy. And I'm going to jump off so I can get back to the family. Thank you, thank uh, you Professor. Uh, Smith. Professor Smith. And I want to thank and everyone. Thank for everyone. Tonight. Please do follow the National Humanities Center on our webpage and our Twitter feed. I want to thank uh, Jennifer Fisher for joining us tonight and being a fantastic live tweeter. Uh, if you Following the center, you'll see a lot of, uh, of what she shared about tonight's uh, session. Uh, we'll be announcing new opportunities and upcoming events on both our social media and our website. Uh, please do pay attention to both, uh, and hopefully you can join us. Our next webinar is scheduled for just two nights from now. This will take us into the Thanksgiving holiday break. I'll be joined by Carla Pistana from uh, UCLA. She'll be working with us on the world of Plymouth Plantation. This is the 402nd anniversary of, uh, of that. And I'm really looking forward to that conversation taking us into Thanksgiving. Thanks again for uh, joining us tonight. Please have a, a, a productive and a safe day at school tomorrow. We'll see you next time on the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. <laughs>